Good morning. Thank you all for being here. I'm Caroline Lucas. I'm the executive director of the Coalition of Kaiser Permanente Unions. The Coalition of Kaiser Permanente Unions is composed of 12 local unions across seven states and the District of Columbia and includes 85,000 frontline healthcare workers. Our members are the first person you see when you walk in the door at Kaiser Permanente and the person who preps you to Some of these folks are here with me today. I'm joined here by rank and file healthcare workers who are part of our national bargaining team with Kaiser Permanente. Now that the Teamsters settled their contract with UPS, these negotiations are the largest single employer bargaining in the United States. We are here today because there is a crisis in patient care at Kaiser Permanente. Our whole country struggled through the pandemic, but the experiences of frontline healthcare workers were like no other. COVID changed everything. The healthcare staffing crisis was already bad, but COVID made it worse. As you will hear from these workers here today, too many facilities are stretched to the brink. They're understaffed. The patients who are left, the people who are left to provide care are maxed. Our healthcare workers deserve raises that keep up with the cost of living. The rising cost of living has made it hard for healthcare workers, and many are leaving the field altogether. Kaiser used to be the industry leader but they have abdicated that role by failing to work with us to solve the staffing crisis. And we are all paying for it, the patients, our families, and the folks providing the health care. Today, you will hear stories from frontline health care workers who are struggling with the patient care crisis at Kaiser. But first, I want to bring up Dave Reagan, president of SEIU United Healthcare Workers West, the largest union in our coalition. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline, and uh, good morning, everybody. As Caroline said, my name's Dave Reagan. I'm the president of SEIU, United Healthcare Workers West, uh, and our union, uh, which is a statewide union of healthcare workers here in California, represents 58,000 of the 85,000 frontline caregivers at Kaiser Permanente. And what I think we would like to share uh, with all of the assembled members of the press and the public is that there's really a very basic and unfortunately too familiar story that's playing out here at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, and recently the press uh, and the public's attention has uh, descended on us in Los Angeles and I suppose it's appropriate as Caroline said, that here we are with the largest single employer set of negotiations going on in America, right in the center and the hotbed of what's been called uh, the hot union summer of 2023. And here in this city, we've seen education workers, teachers, hotel workers, actors, screenwriters, and most recently the Teamsters uh, sound the same sorts of themes and the same sorts of examples that we're facing here in healthcare as well. But what's different about these negotiations is first and foremost that it is a large national healthcare company, Kaiser Permanente, that we're negotiating with. But what's also different is there's two features about Kaiser that in a strange sort of way distinguish these negotiations from the others that have been taking place here. The first is that Kaiser Permanente, at least officially under the law, is a not-for-profit healthcare company. And even though they're officially not-for-profit, this year Kaiser Permanente will take in more than $100 billion in revenue. The first time in the history of this company that's been around for over 75 years that that will happen. The second thing that's true is that for the last 25 years, Kaiser has had a labor management partnership that we've all been proud to be a part of. And that partnership was born out of a lot of labor strife and upheaval in the 1980s 
and it served as a foundation for how we've conducted ourselves for the last 25 years. But what we've experienced as frontline healthcare workers in the last few years is that Kaiser has lost its way on this partnership. We used to talk a lot in uh, Kaiser and among the coalition unions about the value compass, that this is something we aspire to have as the best place to work, the best place to receive care if you're a patient, the best place to give care if you're a healthcare worker. And what these negotiations have brought into stark relief is that what we're experiencing and the reason that we are here today is that we feel like our values and Kaiser's values are not currently aligned. Gathered with us today are the elected representatives of the 85,000 frontline healthcare workers. And as you heard a moment ago, we have made a decision. This morning, the elected leadership of the coalition voted unanimously that we will begin conducting strike authorization votes starting on August 28th and going through September 13th to seek approval from the 85,000 members of the coalition to launch what will be the largest strike of healthcare workers in the history of the United States. That's where we've gotten to on the heels of a pandemic, a once in a century event. And I can say in our organization, 63 members of UHW lost their lives to the pandemic. Healthcare workers for the last three years have been pushed to the limits. It's been traumatic, it's been exhausting, it's been debilitating in so many ways. And we came to these negotiations thinking this was the time that we were going to reset the relationship with Kaiser Permanente, that we were gonna recommit ourselves to a partnership. And we expected to do right by each other given the extraordinary set of unprecedented things that we've been through. And unfortunately, our experience has been quite different than what we hope to have here. In the last three days, and this was the fifth set of uh, multi-day negotiations we've had, the Kaiser management bargaining team literally refused to even enter the room and talk to us. They've taken the position that they don't want to speak to frontline healthcare workers, which is just from a common sense point of view, an unbelievable thing given what we've all been through, but from a legal perspective, it's also a violation of the law. We have filed over a dozen bad faith bargaining charges, both for the individual local unions and the coalition as a whole. We expect to prevail on those with the National Labor Relations Board. We have the ability to strike as early as October 1st. And if that strike comes to pass, it will be what's called an unfair labor practice strike. It will be a strike that is fundamentally about the illegal bargaining conduct of Kaiser Permanente. Some other things in addition to the pandemic that are unprecedented is we in the healthcare industry, there's a trend going on across the country where although our employers like Kaiser Permanente are official, officially nonprofit organizations, they really are nonprofit in name only. This is not your grandparents community hospital. Nonprofit hospitals, and in all the states we operate, California, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, Colorado, Virginia, Washington, DC, and Maryland, nonprofit hospitals were originally founded, including in all our organizations, as something that the citizens and the taxpayers gave a break, the right not to have to pay taxes on the revenue of these corporations in return for contributing something to the local communities. But we're now in a place in this country and in Kaiser Permanente where these organizations don't resemble at all what they were originally intended to be. Kaiser Permanente in the last six months this year has made $3.3 billion in profit. 
If it were a for-profit enterprise, 3.3 billion the first six months of this year, they will not pay taxes on any of that money because they are officially not for profit. The net worth of Kaiser Permanente in the last 12 months has gone from $50 billion to over $62 billion. Their investment portfolio holdings now exceed $120 billion. The CEO of Kaiser Permanente was paid for the last year reported almost $17 million. We can identify 49 other executives who two years ago, the last year the filings took place, were paid over a million dollars each. Again, this is a nonprofit organization in name only. And the reason that they're not paying taxes on billions of dollars of investment earnings, $100 billion in revenue is because the public, because all of us said we had a social contract, we had an agreement. Kaiser has lost its way. We are exhausted. We have made a decision that we're not going to take this anymore. And if Kaiser does not come correct, in the next 45 days or so before the expiration of this agreement, there will be a nationwide strike and that will be something that is avoidable. It would be a tragedy. It is not what this workforce wants to do, but it is what we are being left no choice to do. The issue that everybody has talked about here in Los Angeles, and I want to remind everyone that this workforce works in San Diego, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, Oakland, Sacramento, Portland, Honolulu, Seattle, Denver, and Washington, D.C. These are all high cost markets. Housing, interest rates, gasoline, groceries, this workforce cannot keep up with what's happening out there. And Kaiser has to understand to whom much is given, much is expected, especially if you don't pay taxes, especially if you have a series of benefits and gifts in a real sense that the public has bestowed on you. That's what's going on. This is not a joke. This is real life. We are not kidding. And this is a workforce, it's worth mentioning, is three quarters women. This is an industry and a workforce that is dominated by women and women who do lots of jobs in their lives, taking care of their families, taking care of their children, taking care of their coworkers and the patients that come to us every single day. And so we are asking and we are saying to Kaiser, hear us, we have made a decision. We were here the last three days and you couldn't find the grace and the courtesy to come and talk to us. If this is how it's going to continue to be, you will see all of us in seven states in the District of Columbia in public in front of your facilities, again, taking, play, taking part in the largest strike of healthcare workers in the history of this country. There's something going on out there, workers in all kinds of industries and in all kinds of parts of this country are experiencing something because life is hard and to those that have the most, they are tone deaf about what is going on with people who work for a living, live paycheck to paycheck and do the kinds of things that we all depend on but we sometimes forget about every single day. One other thing I wanna mention, and it goes to this issue of the so-called not-for-profit status of Kaiser. Kaiser Permanente is a unique organization. It operates hospitals, clinics, there's a series of medical groups, and there's also a health insurance plan. The majority of these 85,000 folks are actually employed by one of the Permanente medical groups. The Permanente medical groups are the so-called employer of record for this workforce. The Permanente medical groups are not not-for-profits. They are for-profit limited liability corporations that are owned by the doctors. They are under no obligation to report their finances to the public. 
For the most recent year available, Kaiser Permanente contracted with the medical groups for a total cost of 29 plus billion dollars to provide physician services and to operate the part of the organization that they're responsible for. $29 billion that goes into a black box and we don't know how profitable they are. We don't know what the compensation levels are, what the incentives are. This is part of what the public is so frustrated about with healthcare. That it is one of the most expensive things that any of us deal with. And we know more about the appliances we buy, the cars we buy, anything else we buy in our lives, but there's this enormous black box around healthcare. To those whom much has been given, much is expected. And we are not going to be silent. We are not going to look the other way. That you need to walk the talk. You need to be the best place to work, the best place to receive care with the best workforce in the American healthcare system. Last point I want to make. There is a staffing crisis in the American healthcare system. The people who are still here and who've worked through the pandemic are doing everything they can to provide the best quality health care to patients who are now being forced to wait longer than ever before, to have care delayed, to come to facilities across this country at Kaiser, and to not get the kind of services that they deserve. We need to fix the healthcare staffing crisis in America, and we're not going to fix it by taking a low road approach to negotiating with the workforce that has been there through the pandemic and will continue to be there going forward. This is about doing right all the way around. This is about not succumbing to the worst trends that we see in terms of the financialization of healthcare and to trying to wring every nickel that we can for an organization that doesn't pay taxes, for an organization that wants to take a low road approach that unfortunately is indistinguishable right now from what we see in so many other industries across America. So for us, this is not a game, this is not a joke, this is real life. But we are determined, we are unified, we are exhausted, we are traumatized, and we are ready to fight come October 1st, if Kaiser does not get their act together and do what's right for this workforce, for their patients, and for communities across these seven states. So I'm going to hand it back to Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Now I'd like to introduce some of our frontline healthcare workers to share their stories about what it's like to treat patients with not enough staff. We all remember how pivotal respiratory therapists were during the pandemic. I want to introduce Liz Grisby, the respiratory therapist at Kaiser Roosevelt. Hello, everyone. My name is Liz Grisby, and I'm a respiratory therapist at Kaiser Roseville. I worked for Kaiser for 26 years. I'm proudly dedicated my life to serving the Kaiser community. But short staffing has really affected my working conditions. In my time here, I witnessed moments that touched my heart, but one memory that continues to haunt me. Ed, even years later, and it was all due to short staffing. Picture this, a mother, she's pleading for her life. She was battling COVID just after giving birth. She had a desperate plea, please, please Liz, don't let me die. I worked with her for several days she sought comfort and connection to a familiar face to anchor her during her fight. And that face was mine. I made a promise to her to stay by her side. 
to come back and to provide the support she desperately needed. But the painful reality of short staffing prevented me from fulfilling that promise. When I came back, she already died. She was a mother just like myself. She needed someone in her darkest hours. Yet we as respiratory therapists were stretched thin, constantly dealing with the short staffing issues. Today, years later, the staffing shortage is even worse. We are currently short by 11 therapists. A shortage that focus on us on treating triaging patients, which makes a difficult decision of who to attend to first, of who is, le is in the waiting room. Do I check on that ED patient that is suffering from an asthma attack? Or do I go to the person that is in ICU who is so short of breath? Or do I go to NICU with that micro preemie baby that the mother just delivered? It's a crisis, a situation that leaves our hands tied and our hearts heavy. Can you imagine a large hospital, a place of healing being understaffed? It's a reality that's hard to fathom, a situation that needs to change. Even before the pandemic struck, the staffing shortage was felt, but now it's grown to proportions we never could have predicted. Our patient care is hanging by a thread, and it's important that we address this situation heads on. We owe it to our patients. We owe it to that new mother who depended on me to be there by her side, but I could not be there by her side because we were short-staffed. She never got to see her brand new baby whose voice still echoes in my mind today. This is not just a challenge we face. It's a crisis that demands our attention and our action. We must hold Kaiser accountable until they make a change and provide us with the staffing we need and deserve so we can provide the best care and support for our patients' needs. Thank you. Our union members have been with Kaiser for a long time and they have sacrificed a lot. I want to introduce Katherine Engler a licensed vocational nurse at the Clyde Kaiser Clinic in Carlsbad. Hello, my name is Katherine Engler, and I have been a licensed vocational nurse for 36 years at the Kaiser Carlsbad Clinic. I currently work in our nurses clinic. We've had our ups and downs for the last 36 years that I've worked at Kaiser, but now is the scariest time. I love what I do but short staffing is affecting my working conditions and I'm having trouble working under these conditions. Our patient load is higher and there's fewer of us. Patients are waiting longer to be seen. Patients are coming in sicker. And because we're so short staffed, some only get care through a telephone appointment or a video visit. They really need an in-person visit. And I'm afraid many of them are falling through the cracks. I lie awake at night wondering if I did everything I'm supposed to for both my family and my patients. It scares me that we don't have enough staff. Healthcare workers are leaving the industry because they can't take it anymore. Making the existing short staff crisis worse and hurting our patients. One day, I had a patient come to me saying she had been charged more than normal for her injection and she couldn't pay for it. She couldn't get help about her billing, so she was going to stop receiving her shots. I knew she needed these injections, so I took on the task of navigating through Kaiser payment system and helping her correct her bill. 
if I hadn't intervened, she would not have gotten her medication, the shot she needed. I wanna be clear, this was an exception, not the rule. At our current staffing levels, I don't have time to do that type of work. It made me angry that she couldn't get the help she needed on her own. I felt sorry for my patient. She is on a limited income and was paying good money to be a Kaiser patient. These are supposed to be her golden years. It shouldn't be that hard for her to get basic care that she needs. It's not right. I would have left Kaiser a long time ago if I didn't love my patients and what I do. Management has come and gone, but I've been there. Kaiser can afford to hire more healthcare workers to ensure patients get the care they need and deserve. They can help retain experienced staff by paying healthcare workers a fair wage that keeps up with inflation and the cost of living. Kaiser Permanente can and must do better. Thank you. You know, our members aren't just the ones providing your care. They're also patients of Kaiser Permanente. I want to introduce Audrey Cardenas Loewe, a benefit specialist in Hillsboro, Oregon. Hello, I am Audrey Cardenas Loeta, and I work in our Hillsboro Kaiser Dental Facility as a fees and benefit support specialist. As Kaiser workers, not only do we provide care in our facilities, but our families also get that same care in those same facilities. I am a mother of five, including my son, who was born prematurely. He's actually the reason I got into healthcare 10 years ago. My son had many healthcare issues since he was born. He's 12 now, but still needs a lot of care. He has had issues that cause him difficulty swallowing, and he chokes on things when he drinks, which pains me in ways you can't even imagine. He's been hospitalized multiple times over the past 10 years. I've had taken him to different specialists, but it takes several months to get appointments to get his care. We've been waiting actually since May to get a surgery he desperately needs. And they're telling me it could be another six to nine months to get him on that schedule. As a mother, this is absolute torture. Six to nine months waiting to know if my son's gonna be okay. Six to nine months of him struggling, worrying he's gonna choke in front of me. We end up using emergency care services because he can't be seen by his primary care provider. Aside from using emergency services from something we should have been able to be seen at a regular appointment, it also causes a lot of financial struggles by paying for those ER visits. When I first got to the Kaiser Insurance, I was so excited because I thought to myself, finally, my son's gonna get the care he needs. But sadly and unfortunately, we are still waiting to get that care. I share my story because I know I am not the only patient that is going through this. There are so many more families out there who have lost their loved ones because of delays in care due to short staffing. I feel like I myself are failing our patients. And as healthcare workers, we are doing everything we can, but we still feel like it's not enough. Even though short staffing is really affecting my work conditions, I genuinely care about our patients. And I know this is where I'm supposed to be. It's Kaiser's management that's putting us in this position. We are so tired, we are overworked, we are overwhelmed, and many of us are leaving. And then what will be left of our healthcare industry? I stay because our patients need the support, but to be honest, I don't know how much longer I can hang on. I wanna be able to work for a place that I'm proud of like I used to be, but right now I don't feel that way. Kaiser can do better and Kaiser needs to do better. They have the money and they have the resources. We need them to now show up for us healthcare workers so we can be there for our patients. Thank you. You've heard from three of our frontline healthcare workers, but just know that we have 85,000 more stories like this. 
Our coalition stretches from Hawaii to Washington, D.C. I'm privileged to introduce to you Linda Bridges, president of OPEIU Local 2 in Silver Springs, Maryland. As you all have heard, patient care is in crisis at Kaiser Permanente. Staffing was decimated during the pandemic and it has not gotten any better. The problem we're dealing with is Kaiser is not hearing us. They're not understanding the trauma or the anguish of 85,000 members and what they went through on behalf of our patients and on behalf of that company. Kaiser used to hold out as the best place to get care. It used to be the best place to work, but it's failing on both right now. Kaiser can and must do better. They can afford to hire more people and they can afford to help our frontline healthcare workers keep up with the cost of inflation. They should be at the bargaining table. We are demanding that Kaiser bargain in good faith. They need to stop the unfair labor practices and address the health care staffing needs now. This is why today we are announcing tens of thousands of Kaiser health care workers across the country will be voting on whether or not to authorize a strike over an unfair labor practices that Kaiser can't seem to stop doing. We're going to be starting this on Saturday, August 26th, because we need more staffing, not more sacrifice from the front line at Kaiser Permanente. Thank you. You've heard from our union leaders, you've heard from our union members. Now we're happy to answer any other questions you have for us. If you're in the room, please raise your hand. We'll bring a mic to you. If you're on Zoom, type your question into chat and indicate which outlet you're with and who you're representing. Hi, um, I'm Emily Alpert Reyes with the LA Times. Can you elaborate on what the unlabor, uh, unfair labor, pra labor practices from Kaiser Permanente are? Absolutely, Dave, do you wanna? So there's really, I think, two broad categories. Um, one of the requirements for employers and also for unions is you have an obligation to provide relevant information, uh, you know, as context and to make sure that there's open and fair negotiations. Kaiser has refused to provide us with dozens of pieces of information, documents, data that we've requested and which speak directly to what are called mandatory subjects of bargaining. Um, for instance, we have not received requested information around uh, financial performance in the various regions. That includes operating margins, different uh, metrics around cost, um, other sources of information that we need to be able to evaluate against the general claims they they make in the negotiation. So there's most of the unfair labor practice charges are around a violation of their obligation to bargain in good faith and specifically uh, to provide relevant information on mandatory subjects of bargaining. Secondly, Kaiser has an obligation to bargain with the representatives of the unions. It's up to us to determine who it is that represents us in these negotiations and Kaiser does not have the legal right to say we're not going to come and talk to you because we think your team is too large, which is what they've said to us this week. Everybody here assembled today is elected by coworkers. This is an enormously large workforce. It's 85,000 people. And frankly, what Kaiser wants is us to agree to assemble a subgroup of a handful of folks so that they don't have to 
uh, present their proposals and defend their proposals and negotiate over their proposals out in the open with the elected representatives, representatives of the workforce. That's illegal. Um, it's totally uh, inappropriate. It violates, you know, just common sense notions of how you ought to treat people. Um, but it's also a legal violation. So those are the two major categories. There's some other things. Uh, and if you want further, you know, we'd be happy to provide you with the specific charges if you're interested, but that's most of them. To follow up, we got our first economic proposal from Kaiser via email. Jorge Macias with La Penia newspaper, the largest Spanish newspaper in, in Los Angeles. And uh, my question is, is this, what patients can expect nationwide from you guys if during the pandemic, you were lauded as heroes, and now it seems nationwide that you are being treated like heroes. Yes, and also, you have the professional obligation to take care about the people in Kaiser Permanent Hospitals. Absolutely. It's such an important point. You've heard the stories about what our folks do every single day and how they put themselves on the line for their patients. Every single person here in this room, every person in our in our union wants to be at the bedside, wants to be at the front desk helping patients. That's what they joined the healthcare workforce to do. We're calling on Kaiser to provide them the resources to enable them to do it. No one wants to go on strike. All of us want to settle a good contract to be able to do that work. We're calling on Kaiser to make sure we don't have to take this step. We have a, turn on my mic. I want to check, so is- We have a question from- oh. Sorry, so is voting definitely starting Saturday or only if a settlement is not reached by then? The voting is starting Saturday. It will kick off in Denver, Colorado with a CIU Local 105 and start across the country at the, the following week. Sure. Ready? We have a question from Lucinda of KOGO. If you authorize and implement a strike, how would that impact patient care? Would you all strike at the same time across the country? It's an excellent question. We would stand in solidarity across all seven of our states and District of Columbia and strike where, where we're able to. And Dave, do you want to talk a little bit more about our expectations during that time? Sure. Just one thing everyone should know is that as healthcare workers, we're required to give what's called a 10 day notice. Um, because we care for human beings, it's unlike other industries where you don't have to give advance notice, but we're obligated to, to provide Kaiser with a 10 day notice. Our intention um, is that we can strike as early as October 1st in almost all of the regions and all of the cities that we've described. We are unified as a coalition. We had a heart to heart conversation among ourselves this morning uh, and we want to present a unified committed determined workforce to kaiser uh, we have to go through the voting process and that will conclude i believe by september 13th right in mid-september and september 16th excuse me i misspoke and then we'll be prepared to issue a 10-day notice but we have every intention of doing it together and doing it all across the country One more question. Could you please be specific about what was the last best offer provided by Kaiser Permanente in terms of salaries and benefits? And uh, if you are willing to accept it or reject it, why is the, the biggest point? Because the charges of violations you already mentioned, but being specific about your salaries, your benefits, and all those kind of things. Could you please provide us exactly what is going on? I would love to provide you exactly what is going on, but unfortunately, Kaiser has yet to make a full economic proposal to us. We've been bargaining for four months now, four months. We gave them our economic proposal 21 days ago in writing, 
verbally, we've asked to have conversations, we've asked for them to come and meet with our bargaining team and tell us what they're interested in doing in terms of across the board wage increases, healthcare benefits, all the things our folks care about, and they've refused. So no specifics? Absolutely none. With 38 days left in our contract, no, in four months of bargaining, no specifics. So no specifics, for example, for a worker here in, Cal in Southern California, you mentioned about housing, yes. groceries, and everything, and it's almost impossible for everybody to have a, a standard way of living. Yes. What is going to happen if you guys decided to go on a strike with these economic situations? You're asking the same questions our members are asking when they're trying to make their check stretch, right? Our folks' pay, their real take-home pay because of inflation is reduced in terms of buying power. You know what's not reduced? Rent groceries, gas, all the things that you're saying. We told them, we had folks come up and share their stories about how many hours they had to commute to get into work. Two hours many times in Los Angeles, either direction, to then work an eight, 10, 12 hour shift, providing care to you all to drive home for another two hours because they cannot afford to live where they work. And Kaiser listened to that story and they told us it touched their heart. And then they told us our members were overpaid. So you draw your own conclusions about where their heads are. So basically you are talking about modern slavery in the United States? Yes. 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 No, I, I appreciate the question and I, I just want us all to be very specific. We, our, the coalition's economic proposal was for a four-year contract with annual pay increases of 7% in the first year, 7% in the second year, six and a quarter percent in the third, and in the fourth year, six and a quarter percent. We are behind because of the cost of living increases and everything Caroline has talked about. Uh, and as she correctly said, Kaiser has not even made a counter proposal. Four months into negotiations, refusing to come in the room and talk to us, no counter proposal. We have additionally proposed a minimum wage of $25 an hour across uh, the whole of Kaiser Permanente. You, I think everyone understands you cannot live, you cannot take care of a family in Los Angeles, San Diego, Denver, Washington DC, Seattle, Honolulu on $19, 20 $21 an hour. Kaiser did make one minor economic proposal by email yesterday to establish a $21 an hour minimum wage in the year 2026. That is the level of respect and seriousness that they are bringing to these negotiations. We have made a decision. If that's the way this is going to happen, we're not going to sit around for, you know, several more weeks doing nothing. We are going to take a vote and we can negotiate this contract in a serious way, but that's what we're dealing with. And that's the, the level of, I think, frustration uh, that people have and why we've made this decision. Uh, so we'll, take, we'll take one question online and then we'll come back to LA Times. Okay, so Ferenda with KQED is asking, how many facilities would a strike impact would it be all Kaiser facilities? And Lucinda from KOGO is also asking on top of that question. And so how would that impact patient care? Great questions. So as a nationwide strike, it would impact dozens of Kaiser facilities. I can say in Northern California, we have about 24 um, uh, medical centers and hospitals. And in Southern California, about 23, I believe, and uh, dozens across the country. We do, you know, provide the 10 day notice to Kaiser Permanente as both a legal and an ethical requirement because we do care about patient care and Kaiser would need to because of the scope of the classifications we represent. Kaiser will need to figure out how it provides that patient care during that time period. Dave, did you want to add? Nationally, Kaiser has between 11 and 12 million members. There are hundreds of thousands of people who go to receive care every day all across the country. If there is a nationwide strike, it will affect all hospitals, medical office buildings, and clinics in all states except for the state of Georgia, 
where Kaiser has a very tiny operation and we don't represent people in Georgia. But this coalition uh, works in facilities for over 95% of those 11 to 12 million people. The other thing I think everybody should understand is right now, how will this affect patient care? The delays will get worse, the disruptions will get worse, the quality will get worse, and we have all seen ads in our local areas where Kaiser is right now recruiting strike breakers and paying people on the order offering wages three times what the incumbent workforce receives for the purposes of defeating a strike. That is totally out, out of bounds, totally indefensible. This is the workforce that suffered through and worked through the pandemic and stayed to provide care. This is not how we should be doing this. This is not the way to do business. It's 11 to 12 million people who are going to experience a deteriorating level of care and a lot of uncertainty about how this will be done. I just would, I would just add to that and say, yes, will a strike impact patient care? It would, it would cause delays. But do you know what else causes delays in patient care? Not having the staff to treat the patients. Waiting six months in Colorado for a radiology appointment, that causes delays in care. We would go on strike because we care about fixing those things. Um, is there any estimate of what proportion of the Kaiser Permanente workforce is represented by unions in the coalition? That's a great question. I think it's just about half. And we can double check that math and get back to you for specifics. Okay, I believe we have additional questions online. Sure, we have Jake Thomas from the Lund Report. And Jake is asking, will the strike authorization votes by local unions be held in sequences? If so, what is the sequence? They will be starting in Denver, Colorado this Saturday, and they kind of spread out from there. The bulk of them will be the starting Monday at the 28th and run that week. There will be some in other markets that go as late as September, mid-September. And we can provide you a full list of the strike vote dates if that's helpful. And we have one more online. Sure, and we have Ferinda with KQED asking, and are negotiations happening in Oakland at Kaiser corporate offices? Negotiations for next bargaining session, we kind of, we've changed locations. Our next bargaining session is in San Francisco, and that will be in September. Unfortunately, we have five bargaining sessions and 38 days left in this contract. Great, thank you so much for your time. If there are no further questions.